Thanks, Raj. What a wonderful prayer. Oh, I got up a bit too early, didn't I? So now I'm thrown myself. I have a question for you. Let's see who's been listening for the last few weeks. We're in the middle of a series called One Thing. Can anyone stretch their minds back to the first week that Phil introduced? What was the first one thing? Does anyone remember? One thing I lack. Oh, 10 points for Joan in the front here. Well done, Joan. One thing I lack was the very first week. How about last week? Anyone's got one thing? The blind man. What was it? One thing I know. So you can see behind me already, this week's is one thing I need. By the way, if you want to catch up and you've missed the series, we do have our own little YouTube channel where you can um, watch, keep up to date with the series. So if you're away or you weren't, uh, aren't able to make it, uh, check that out and you can be up to date with the series. So one thing I need. I wonder if someone asked you right now, maybe even the person next to you could chat for a moment, 30 seconds, if someone was to say, what's one thing you need? Maybe you could share it with the person next to you. What's one thing you need? I need a glass of water. No. <laughs> Might grab one. <laughs> I'm sure we have a bit of variety of answers there. I heard, I heard sleep. <laughs> I think it was Will that I heard it from. He's just... <laughs> Any other things people want to call out? What's one thing that you need? A maid. A maid. That would be nice. That would be really lovely. A loving and happy family. Oh, a loving and happy family. We're getting to the heart of things now, aren't we, Richard? Very true. We need all sorts of things, don't we? Yeah, we need peace. We need money to survive. We need love and relationship. We need a whole lot of things. Yet, out of all the things we need in life, what is the one thing we actually need? And we're gonna look at that today. And it might become very, very obvious as we read this very short passage. And you can probably get up here and preach it yourself. But let's, have, let's unpack it today. We're gonna to look at Luke 10 verse 38 to 42, if you've got your Bibles on you. A famous little four-verse passage about a couple of sisters, Mary and Martha. And these two sisters host Jesus in their home, and from this story we learn simply an important truth about what we truly need, you could probably tell me already. So let's read it. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will, be not, and it will not be taken away from her. We could kind of leave it there, couldn't we? You go about our mornings, but let's unpack that a little bit more. So let's first look at Martha. Martha was the doer, wasn't she? She was doing something good. I identify quite a lot with Martha. She was preparing her home. She was serving Jesus. There was actually nothing inherently wrong with what she was doing. And in fact, her actions reflected the kind of hospitality that would have been expected. Yet the passage tells us that Martha was distracted by all the preparations. Has this happened to you before? How often do you get so caught up in your to-do lists, your responsibilities, that we become distracted from the presence of God? 
And like Martha, we might even feel frustrated when others don't seem as busy or as stressed out as we are. In Martha's example, we see that even well-intentioned activities, like serving others, preparing our homes, preparing food, can obscure what God values most. There is an interesting point to note here in the passage. Check out the contrast. Martha comes to Jesus calling him Lord, but then tells him what to do. Have you noticed that? Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work? She's telling, using the title Lord, but then says, tell her to help. <laughs> it's an interesting contrast there. And Martha is upset. She's a bit frustrated. And what probably makes it even worse is that Jesus doesn't even seem to be bothered by it. Jesus reorients Martha's priority showing her that the kingdom values are different from earthly values. Where Martha sees productivity as essential, Jesus invites her to see presence with him as priority. This is a call to us too, to reorder our lives around God's kingdom values, where our worth and our identity aren't rooted in work, but in our relationship with him. And I think this echoes Matthew 6.33 where it says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus' kingdom doesn't prioritise status or accomplishment but humble receptivity to his teaching and his presence. And Jesus' response to Martha is not one of condemnation but of gentle correction. Because he uses her name twice. He says, Martha, Martha. And in this, that shows concern and communicates love, indicating that he actually understands her heart and her desire to serve. I um, was having a little bit of a um, look on YouTube yesterday with my kids. We were, I don't know why, we're in the lounge room. So I typed in Mary and Martha. I thought, what, what will we see? There was a whole lot of sermons and all sorts of things. But the Chosen series was on there, and I was so tempted to um, show you the Chosen video, but it did go for nearly 10 minutes, of this interaction. And you can see, obviously, it's a creative thing that's you know, newly produced, but it kind of shows the heart behind uh, what's going on. So I encourage you, have a look. Type in Mary and Martha the Chosen if you uh, have YouTube, and you might uh, be able to just enter that story, that scene again uh, through this week. Jesus is actually not disapproving of Martha's service. He's just inviting her into a way of life that is a lighter one, where he is at the centre and the source of her strength. Jesus invites her and all of us to let go of the need to achieve and instead rest in his loving affirmation. And as already mentioned, Martha's approach to Jesus, it's not wrong in itself, the hospitality was highly placed, uh, highly valued in the Jewish culture, especially towards a respected teacher or guest. However, Martha's distraction reveals how even good things, good activities like serving Jesus, can lead to frustration and resentment when they overshadow the more essential priority of being with Jesus. This story suggests Jesus values presence with him more than performance for him. In Martha's story, in Martha's service, sorry, we see a metaphor for all the ways we try to earn approval through action. And Jesus is teaching us that intimacy with God isn't actually achieved by our works, but through resting in his presence. Works are good. We, if we all just sat in his presence all the time, then we wouldn't, maybe, wouldn't accomplish anything. So we need it, don't we? But it should flow out of our presence with him. Jesus' response to Martha reveals, like his theology, there's the divine sufficiency of Jesus when he says, few things are needed, or indeed only one. 
Jesus shifts the focus from the external tasks to a single internal priority himself. The one thing that Mary chose is Jesus, emphasising that he is sufficient to answer our every need or pursuit. So I wonder in your life, what are some things that keep us from the one thing that we actually need? What are the things that distract you from God? They can even be good things, maybe family commitments, maybe work, other relationships in our lives, maybe entertainment, maybe the, this thing, the phone. I'm sure they're all different for all of us. But I would encourage you to have a think about your life and maybe talk to God about it. I mean, even now, the Holy Spirit might be bringing something to mind for you. Can I encourage you to listen to his voice? So let's think about Mary for a moment. Mary made a different choice, didn't she? Instead of being swept away by the preparations and the busyness, she chose to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his words. There's a couple of things happening. One of those things is in this moment, Mary is also kind of disrupting the social order of the time. Mary, sitting at Jesus' feet, is taking on the position of a disciple, which is traditionally only open to men in this culture. Sitting at someone's feet is a bold statement of intent to learn from, from a teacher and for them uh, to learn to become who they are. So Mary is quite, she's transgressing the social order here. All of Martha's assumptions as well are being challenged about how to be faithful in this situation. And in that moment, Mary recognised something crucial. The most important thing in life is to be with Jesus, to hear his words and to enjoy his presence. And Jesus affirms her choice by saying, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Mary was focused on the one thing she truly needed in that time. It was intimacy with Jesus, knowing him, hearing from him, drawing near to him. Mary's choice reflects a posture of vulnerability, really, to sit and listen rather than act. Relinquish it requires us to kind of give up our control. And sometimes it can be uncomfortable especially in a culture that uh, values productivity. But Mary's act of simply sitting shows her openness to receive from Jesus without the need to earn approval or to impress. I think this is a, an act of faith. It shows that our relationship with God is not built on what we offer, but on what he offers to us. This passage also suggests that spiritual formation not, is not involved, sorry, not just avoiding overt sin, but resisting the subtle distractions that keep us from communion with God. The story shows us that being with Jesus, seeking his wisdom, his peace, his words, it's formative. It shapes us, it shapes our hearts and our minds in a way that being busy and having, doing the activity can't shape us. This echoes Jesus' own practice, doesn't it? When he withdrew to pray, so he would withdraw, he would spend time with God, and then he would re-enter to serve. There's a teaching in, in John 15 about abiding in him. He is the vine, we are the branches. And we are fruitful when we abide in him. Let me ask you, who are you being formed by? The Bible study that I'm a part of, we're starting to do a series called um, Practicing the Way. I don't know if you've heard of the book before. It's quite popular at the moment. The man that wrote it is John Mark Comer. And there's also um, a, a video series about that as well. And um, last week's was talking all about formation and that we're always being formed. 
that we often think that if we spend time with Jesus, you know, that's our formative time of the day. But if we think we're always being formed and we, we have to think about who are we being formed by, how are we being formed, what is shaping us, what are we giving our attention to, these things form us. In some ways they can deform us or they can form us like Jesus. Choosing the one thing that Mary chose doesn't mean we neglect our responsibilities or ignore the tasks that need to be done. It means we give priority to our relationship with Jesus above everything else. And at the end of the day, there is just this one thing that we all need. We need Jesus. The world offers us so many distractions. There was lots of demands for our attention. But the only thing that will truly satisfy the deepest longings of our heart is being in his presence. And Mary's heart shows this. Her heart was available to Jesus. This depth of her devotion points to what Jesus desires for us, that we love him with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. Whoop, sorry, my paper's got stuck there. Mary models this wholeheartedness, letting her love for Jesus take precedent over other concerns. By choosing to sit at his feet, Mary positions herself to receive this spiritual nourishment. In John 6.35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. With this, in this passage, Mary and, Martha, with Mary and Martha, it subtly reflects this truth, showing that intimacy with Jesus is the ultimate source of spiritual sustenance. Martha's busyness illustrates how easy it is to neglect our own spiritual hunger, filling our lives with activities instead. Mary shows us that true fulfilment comes from receiving what only Jesus can give us the sustenance we need to truly live fully for him. Now, if we accept that Jesus is not simply just a friend visiting Mary and Martha's, uh, Martha and Mary's house, like a guest with like ordinary needs and preferences, but actually God in the flesh, the story gains an entire new dimension. Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet because she recognises something special and out of the ordinary is transpiring right in front of her. So I don't want to put contemplation and action against each other. That's not the idea, Martha's action and Mary's contemplation. But this passage suggests that contemplation, the time where we spend our time with Jesus, fuels us for meaningful action. Jesus' emphasis on the one thing doesn't negate the value of service, but it rather calls us to serve from a place of communion with him. I've, I've served out of busyness before. It doesn't feel good. You know, you do get resentful. You get bitter. You think, oh, why didn't they come a bit earlier or help out here and you can start to feel resentful and you're meant to be serving Jesus. And I think that's what this is about. This is echoed in the life of Jesus. Oh, I said that before. I'm going to leave that out. Sorry. <laughs> yes, service rooted in intimacy with Christ becomes more aligned with his purposes and less prone to frustration and distraction. I don't know about you. I want to be aligned with him. The older I get, the more I see the busy. There's good in the busy. But if I haven't spent that time with him, the busy can just be a whole lot of busy and not a lot of fruitfulness. You might be sitting here going, yep, I agree with all of those things that you're saying, Louise. I agree. I know this is what we need. But I find it really hard to orient my life around Jesus. Maybe you are actually really good at this. I'm just going to give us a few suggestions today. Ways that you might be able to sit with Jesus. There are tons and tons of different ways you can be with Jesus. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, but there's some things to consider. 
Maybe you could establish a rhythm of solitude and silence. Have you done that? Have you ever spent time just in silence? No music, no book to read, no podcast to listen to. I am very good at filling any moment with something. The people I work with know it because I'll be like, I watched this the other day and I heard this the other day and I read that the other day. I love learning, like I love that. But when I really think about it, when I think about the heart of this, it's kind of a distraction from dealing with maybe the emotion in my life at that time. It gives me something else to think about. Can I encourage you even to start with just five minutes in silence, sitting with Jesus? No, you don't even have to say anything. Just sit in his presence. And maybe that five minutes might become ten or fifteen. But the silence and solitude enables us to get rid of those distractions and just listen to God. What is he saying to us in that time? Another thing, they're up on the screen now, then you could meditate on scripture. You could spend just that deep reflective time. Maybe just choose a short passage. Look at each word or a phrase and look at it slowly. Reflect on how it speaks to your life and needs. Have you done the thing before? This is, oh, this is another, I'm showing you all my weaknesses today, but I had a year a few years ago that I'm going to read the Bible in a year. And I, like, I was quite prideful about it, I think, now that I think about it. I'd even say, I'm two days ahead on my Bible reading plan. How good is that? Look at me, I'm like killing this. And it was great, actually. If you're ever interested in the Bible app, Nikki Gumbel has a, a year, I can't, it's just called the Bible in a year, I think. And then he also unpacks it. Um, and he's a, he's a good guy. He's the one that wrote Alpha, the Alpha course. So it's a good thing to do. Uh, taught me a lot, but I nearly uh, was reading the Bible in a hurry just to like tick the box at the end to like, I've done that. Well done, Louise. You've got there. I don't know if you, has, has anyone else done things like that before? Or is it just me in the room? I don't know. But meditating on scripture, thinking about it, asking Jesus, how, you know, what, what are you saying to me through this? It also helps us to internalize the, the truth of God's word. Another one is to cultivate a heart of thankfulness and praise. Maybe you could begin each day by just naming a few things or maybe end each day naming a few things that you're thankful for and praising God for his goodness. It reminds us of his sufficiency and love. I, I never forget a few years ago running in my zone and it was called Shout Out and it was like all about thankfulness. And I still remember a little person in the front row that was so keen to be there, but her mother had gone through, was going through cancer treatment and her father had a terminal illness. And yet the thankfulness that come, came out of this little girl astounded me. And I, I just have, I always think of her when I think about thankfulness. I was like, if she can be thankful, I can be thankful. Intentional Sabbath rest is the next one. Have you got an, a habit of Sabbath? Is there a rhythm in your life? I was just talking to someone the other day um, and, and they're trying to like definitely put aside a day of Sabbath. It's not really something we do. I mean, maybe you do, but we don't talk about it a lot. I, I grew up with neighbours that were seven-day Adventists and they were very strict with their Sabbath. And uh, as kids, they would let us come into their home. We were allowed to go and play with our friends, but we weren't allowed to do a whole host of different things. If we listened to music, it was worship music. If we, I don't even think we were allowed to turn the television on. Uh, we were allowed to cook together and just like be in one another's company. I learned a few things around Sabbath. That's a good thing, spending some time to rest in God, to stop the labour and to enjoy his presence without interruption. And prayer as an ongoing conversation. Have you kind of thought of that before? Prayer throughout the day. Instead of only like restricting it to formal prayer times, maybe you can pause through the day, even for a few seconds to share 
with Jesus what's on your heart and mind. In, in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, that reminds us to pray continually. And this practice just keeps bringing our heart back to him repeatedly throughout the day, keeping an awareness of God in our circumstances throughout the day. There's so many more. Recently, I heard about breath prayers. Have you heard of breath prayers before? There's simple prayers where on the breath in, you ask you know, for God's love and on the breath out, you ask for his forgiveness. Uh, there's all sorts of things that we can do. But we don't want to make it a to-do list and a ticking off the box because then it comes service, doesn't it? So have a think about your priorities, about your connection with Jesus. And I encourage you, like Mary, to choose the better thing that won't be taken away. Can I ask a couple of questions? Well, as as, um, I was preparing for this, I thought about that concept of, you know, it's like Mary knew this is Jesus. This is somebody important. This is somebody I need to stop and be with. I need to listen to what he has to say. Even over maybe all the judgment and the anger that my sister might bring me, I need to do this. I wonder if we consider, you know, the fact that we have the Holy Spirit living with us. I don't know. Sometimes in my mind I wonder, like, you have this, like, um, picture of, like, God being there and wanting to talk to us, but we're just going about our day. It's like he's, he's right here, but we're just ignoring him most of the time. Obviously, we can't spend all of our day and all of our time at his feet. But acknowledging that he is God and he is with us and he wants to connect with us. I wonder if we recognised God's presence more, how would that change our priorities? How would living in God's presence affect our own hearts and our mind? And how might it then change what we do, the choices that we make or the way we do things. Can I just maybe just let you sit with those questions for a moment for maybe a minute or two? Just have a time of talking to God yourself and then I'll come back up and pray. Silence can be a beautiful thing sometimes. Sorry to break it for you. Let's pray. Lord, it is only you that knows all of our hearts. It's only you that knows what's going on in the depths of everybody's hearts that are sitting here today. Lord, you know whether we struggle to spend that time with you. Lord, we just ask that you'd forgive us for sometimes ignoring you, for not putting in you in your rightful place in our lives. Lord, we want to do good for you. We want to serve. We want to see um, your kingdom grow, and that does involve us doing, Lord. But Lord, would you help us to prioritise being with you before we do that? Thank you that you use us. Thank you that you desire to speak to us. You want to form us. You want to shape us. You long for our hearts to be open to you. Lord, would you show us? Would you teach us? Would you remind us by your Holy Spirit this week? Just tap us on the shoulder. Remind us that we need to be with you. Lord, help us to find a place where we can enjoy being in your presence. To put our distractions aside, to put our worries aside, put our doing aside and just focus on you. Lord, you have so much you want to share with us. And yet often we just talk at you. 
Thank you that you are a God that wants to be moving and shaping and growing in our lives. So I pray that you would just help us to be available to you. Help us to come and sit with you, Jesus. And would you show us what we need because you know what it is and you are mostly what we need in this life. Yeah, we praise you and we thank you that we serve a God who wants to be in relationship. It's quite astounding really to think about it. Help us to feel that sense of awe and honour for you, Lord, as we come into your presence and help us to be ready to be shaped by you so that we can see you do wonderful things through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everyone.